Welcome to Shi'ur 1700, Hamburg to Ba'av. The first in a special part of the Yudishis Leben in Deutschland 1700 initiative. The goal of Shi'ur 1700 is to proactively cultivate innovative content by partnering traditional Jewish content with contemporary culture to create something new and alive as opposed to offering a voyeuristic look into Judaism, Shiur 1700 takes a partnership approach that we hope will create the latest phase of innovation in the German-Jewish encounter and offer memorable and transformative content that is dynamic and will inspire new and unforeseen Jewish-German experiences. Today, we would like to introduce you to a lesser known Jewish holiday known as Tuba Av, or the 15th of the month of Av. The Jewish community traditionally follows a lunar calendar. The month of Av is historically associated with tragedy, where we mourn the atrocities committed against Jews from ancient times until today. As the moon reaches its full state on the 15th of Av, we transform our sadness into joy and celebrate love, intimacy, and renewal. We will explore this regenerative holiday today through text, discourse, music, and exploring the unique space of Lysala. We're very privileged to have something that really is something that I've always, I've always sought, where Jewish content can be intertwined with contemporary content, where both sides can learn from one another and influence one another to create something thoroughly contemporary and thoroughly new. And we're very grateful today to have participants from the Shior community and from outside, from all around the world, from Hamburg, from Berlin, from other places. And even more special is this incredible opportunity to have original content created with these texts and ideas in mind for this very specific period of time. We have composer and musician Ohad Ben Ari, who will be performing his um, original composition as well as others. And we're super lucky to have Ali Neumann and Leon Krak uh, offer an original composition in dialogue, which is a product of a dialogue with these classical texts and others. Um, and I'm super grateful to have them perform today too. So we're really uh, grateful. And then we have other members here that we, I'll introduce um, as they read. Um, today, we're going to go through a variety of texts and we're going to discuss them. That's another thing that we try to do in Shi'ur, is to introduce this Jewish um, tradition of hermeneutical uh, discourse, where we interpret texts, we, we take them out of context, and we introduce new contexts for these texts. Each of us comes from our own perspective and offers a unique lens. And together, we create something unforeseen until this very moment. And that's something that we can do all the time. And we do that every week at Shior. Um, so we're really grateful to do it here. I'm going to invite Paul Chaim Koritska, um, of, uh, who's currently a law student in Hamburg and active in the Jewish student, um, in the Jewish student groups here. Uh, to read the first text from Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, who was a Roman era um, rabbi and sage. Please. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamaliel said, There were no days of joy in Israel greater than the 15th of Av. Thank you. So this comes from the Mishnah, from Ta'anit. And we have a, a conceivable contradiction here. Because for the fir first of all, Av as we discussed, is a month associated with tragedy and atrocity and suffering. Yet the happiest day, one of the happiest days of the year, is said to be Tuba Av, which happens in that same time. So it's something to think about. What, what can be the connection between tragedy and joy? Chaim, why don't you read the next quote, which comes from Rabbi Nathan Sternhartz, a Hasidic sage in the 19th century. Please. The 15th of Av is a sweetening and a repair of the 9th of Av. Thank you. So we see here this Kabbalistic concept of repair or tikkun. 
where, the, where something tragic, something broken can be fixed. And as part of that fixing and that repair, you get to a space that's even higher. It's very much associated with this idea of descent for the sake of ascent. Sometimes in order to go up, we need to go down. I'll invite Ali now to read a quote from the St. Lucian poet and Nobel Prize winner, Derek Walcott. Ali? Break a vase, and the love that reassembles the fragments is stronger than the love which took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. The glue that fits the pieces is the ceiling of its original shape. Thank you. So let's look at this uh, a little bit deeper. Walcott says that the love that goes into fixing that vase is greater, is stronger than the love that took it for granted. How does this fit into the previous text that we were talking about? Um, I think the breaking point is really, you know, the appreciation. Um, it's, all, you know, also if you have a flower just growing like that, like that in the, the wild, you will not appreciate it the way if you were like fighting for it, if you were really like having a deep understanding of how it works and how it functions. So um, I think um, in order to really appreciate something, you really need to have, have a process of understanding and being with the problem, with the thing, whatever it is. Okay. So I, what I hear here is this idea that the, of contrast. Sometimes it's through the darkness, it's through the, uh, in, the engagement that we find um, those sparks of light that can be forgotten if they're in a field of light. Okay? It also, in my opinion, resonates a bit with the physics of nature. If you take, for instance, a bone and the bone gets broken, when it gets healed, it's even stronger than the original bone. This is so funny because this is what I just write, uh, wrote in my lyrics, like um, the bio biological analogy about where if you break a bone, it's the, the strongest at the point where it's going back together. So, yeah. Excellent. Anama? I, um, uh, what I want to say is um, that in general, when you, when you get to the ground, like you're in the darkness, it's so much easier then to actually see the light. You see much clearer and actually have the motivation, of course, to climb out of this dark hole again. Great. So I see two points. One is this idea of strengthening as a result of the healing process. And, and that healing process allows you to have a much more in-depth uh, and textured understanding of the space. And we see that with relationships too, where the first encounter is very superficial, but it's not until you actually have friction that you understand all the different aspects of the other. And that's what generates lo love. Sarah? Yeah, I would say as well that we get so easily sort of accustomed to a certain state. And so to just have that change of state, that contrast, like you were saying, I think that also encourages us to just acknowledge that it could be different. And so we don't take for granted as easily the, the sort of state that we've gotten used to, whether that's in a relationship that's gone stale or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's this idea of dynamism that, that stimulates that stimulates change and awareness. Ali? Um, you know, um, I was just thinking about um, um, another uh, Shio uh, newsletter that um, you, you, I was reading, and it was about um, Japanese um, vase uh, fixing art, and that also um, the object itself m m might be way, um, way more expensive if it was fixed because, um, you know, all of the love that was put into the struggle and also but seeing it and seeing what's underneath the surface and kind of getting how it works so I just had to think about yeah. that. And I think that in this art they they run gold over the cracks where the cracks have been right yes. and so they emphasize the the actual breaking as as an element of the beauty. Exactly and the reason why I wanted to start with this is because to me the German Jewish relationship is very much like this where we cannot ignore the brokenness. We cannot ignore the absence, the cracks that are still there, um, but it also offers us an opportunity in the process of healing to get somewhere that we could not have been. And keep that in mind as we go through these texts. Um, I'm going to invite somebody very special, we're very lucky to have with us here, and that's Sahi Slater. Sachi Slater is a postdoc from Israel here in Hamburg. 
And Sahi is focusing on restoring um, awareness to several forgotten um, rabbis, some of who were murdered by the Nazis in the war, um, whose works have not been published. Many of them still remain in manuscript um, form. And there's a particular rabbi that Sahi focuses on, Rav Shmuel Alexandrov, who combined a lot of the ideas of 20th century anarchism with Jewish mysticism. And he lived in, during the midst of the Russian Revolution. And he was somebody who took a very, um, a very alternative and unique approach. And again, he's somebody who's almost virtually unknown. In Shiur, we talk about him a lot because we're very lucky to have Sahi in the uh, community. Um, and what we're going to look at now is a quote from a letter that is still unpublished. This is a letter that only remains in archival form. And it's kind of incredible that uh, we're able to share this here publicly in one of the first times. Um, and I'm going to invite Atsahi to read um, a small quote from it. In every era, the tools that were produced according to the spiritual situation of the previous era break down in the era that follows. Thank you. This is from a letter to um, Alter Hilovitz. Um, from 1928. So what we see here is that every era has its own tools to contend and deal with the issues of its time. But the minute the next era is inaugurated, those tools become obsolete. What worked for one era doesn't necessarily work for the next era. So this leads to a situation where the broken and obsolete tools must undergo themselves a transformation. And Rav Alexandrov saw this constantly changing nature as an inherent aspect of life. Sachi, if you can read the next um, text. The process of, break, of breaking of the tools and fixing, and, and fixing them is permanent. Thank you. So what we see here is the only thing that's permanent is the, the, is the breaking of the tools. And what's, for those of you that are familiar with, um, with Jewish mysticism, what Rav Alexandrov is doing is something radical here. There's a term called shvirat hakelim, shvirat hakelim, which means shattering of the vessels. And this is a mystical concept uh, in the Jewish tradition that says that the origin of the world was once this contained light, but the light couldn't, couldn't contain itself and it burst. And all the vessels that contain the light broke. And the whole process of rectification of the, the whole human experience is one of healing and fixing those broken shards, those broken pieces. But what he does here is that in Hebrew, the word for vessel, keli or kli, is also the same word for tool. So he does something beautiful here where, he's, where he takes this Kabbalistic concept of the breaking of the vessels and he repurposes it to this idea of the breaking of the tools. And even if we want to um, keep this idea of vessels, this, the old vessel, he's also saying the vessels and forms that worked in one era don't work in the next era. So we really could understand it both ways. And Sahi, maybe you can say a little bit about... Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I, I want to say about what we discussed earlier. I think it's a very uh, Jewish experience, if, if you will. The, the exile, the, bre the, the way that... Uh, the old uh, uh, form broke down, and the new form is based on on, on longing about uh, on uh, uh, on the missing part that that you can feel sometimes even stronger the, as opposed to as it was before before everything broke down, and those longing to to the forgotten uh, to the forgotten past is, is a very uh, uh, strong experience. Uh, for for the Jewish experience, what what and in that regard, what he's trying to say is that in in many ways the 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 maps of meaning that you are born into or that you are uh, uh, growing up into are maps of meaning that were created for you, and and in many regards they're not totally fit you and and that when those maps of, of meanings are breaking down, it's a very harsh experience. It's very hard, it's very dark. But if you, but, but this breaking of the tools, this breaking of the vessels allows you to, 
build new ones and, and those new ones are like the bone. They are stronger, they more fit you. If, you, if you're courageous enough to go out there and, and, and break them and, and rebuild. And, the, and those re rebuilding of the vessels are crucial in order to create a meaningful life, a meaningful experience. Beautiful. Um, I think this is really what we're doing today, is we're rebuilding vessels. We're breaking old vessels, old tools, and we're creating new tools. And this is something that could only happen because of the tragedies that we've experienced already. And I think the other thing here that's really present and obvious is we're in an empty, in an empty space. And the emptiness here operates on multiple levels. There's the emptiness, of course, of corona. Um, there's the emptiness of, of this space being once a space popular with the Jewish community of Hamburg uh, that, that is no longer here. Um, the, the absent Jewish person uh, in discourse in Germany. But then there's also that, that absence creates an awareness and it's a certain paradox that sometimes when something's gone, you're thinking about it more than when it's there. Now, of course, we would never advocate uh, um, emptying out a, a space, but when it does happen, sometimes that can bring us to a much closer space. And this is something that exists in Jewish theology. There's a lot of this idea of the theology of absence, that we need to go through absence. And there's also this idea that Rav Alexandrov talks about, which is the yearning itself is the sanctity. The sacred is not in what you feel, but it's in what you seek. And it's in that feeling of seeking, that itself, that emotional state, that offers um, the, the sacred in, and in, not in any ontological essence itself. Mm -hmm. You're talking about physical absence, and then also I think that some of the tools uh, could be like our tradition, and, uh, and also uh, losing this tradition, kind of like trading it in or betraying the tradition is also uh, part of the tools that can be uh, looked upon in a new light. Beautiful. In fact, the word tradition comes from the same Latin root, tradere, as traitor and to betray. And it exists also in Hebrew, mesora and mesira. And it's something very powerful that every time you surrender, again, the, the word uh, tradition comes from the word surrender. Every time that you surrender, you're betraying the tradition that you had as you give it to the next person. That next person is betraying what they had before to accept this new tradition. There's a dual surrender, a dual betrayal. But in that dual betrayal, you're creating something absolutely new. And that's what we're engaged with now. And we need to be aware of that because it's that consciousness that creates meaning. Ali? That was um, when you talked about, you know, um, if longing, longing sometimes is, you know, um, a stronger feeling than if someone is still there or something is still there. So it's about the absence. And there was a female philosopher who said, um, like, a marriage uh, cannot take bad um, table habits, but it will always survive death. So it's a very radical, um, you know, comparison, but it's really uh, the longing. Maybe you would have been divorced tomorrow because you really cannot stand the person. But um, if someone's not there anymore, or yeah, also in my family I have the experience, when someone um, is not there anymore, the, the person becomes a bigger, glorified, and a lot more, you know, uncriticizable. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, I think that's the thing is because it's not, it, it's, it's like not tangible anymore. You can romanticize it. You can sort of create this idea that is your own sort of creation as opposed to it being something that's actually there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's exactly the point is things, th we oftentimes confuse what we long for. And actually when you're longing for something, you're dwelling in that feeling of, of yearning and longing because it's not there, so you're not dwelling in that itself. It's really that longing and yearning and desire that you're dwelling in. And by acknowledging that, we can work actually to be okay with that, to cultivate that. Um, and there is a certain paradox to acknowledge that utopia only exists as something that you yearn towards. But that doesn't mean you give up yearning. And we do that every Shabbat. We do that every week. And all these holidays are there to create those spaces. But also one question. Sure. Um, like when we when we speak about um, 
absence or loss of something and um, you start to reflect why you actually miss certain things or traditions or whatever and um, you also put yourself in like a certain relation what it actually meant to you and like what egoism for example also means like why do you actually miss somebody or something and what your position in, is in this um, relationship you know like maybe sometimes um, or before like the person was there um, and now the person's absence now you understand what this person actually was for you and why you're actually um, longing for this person and maybe like the certain egoism you know shows through so you have to understand like why do you feel this absence and you're longing for someone or something yeah i mean i think that we can certainly psycho psychologize a lot of the ways that we relate to the world and that can be very helpful in certain cases uh, to clarify w why we behave certain ways and why our emotions run in certain ways and i think there's a lot of power that we have in determining how we choose to organize life and i think that is really the radical choice that we all have is the acknowledgement and it's a choice to acknowledge to that we that we are the organizers of our lives i, I could add to that and say uh, also out of personal experience really as a person or as a human being we appreciate stuff when it's taken away from us like and kind of like complementing what uh, the, uh, Sarah and uh, yeah absolutely So I want to ask, what tools need to be broken in order to be fixed? 
What tools are broken, but we don't realize it yet? What new tools are being introduced during this time of change? And I think it's something that's so present, not only um, after the war, when suddenly, uh, when suddenly a whole generation of people had to completely reevaluate everything that they were taught, but also in a, in a smaller scale in, in our generation too, with Corona and many other situations, many things that we took for granted and in a very physical and, and material way have changed. The way that we organize life has changed. I think we cannot underscore enough the um, effect of digital in transforming the way that we organize life and we connect. There's so many different things that are happening right now. And the question is, how do we respond to that? And one way I would argue is um, what we're doing today is to acknowledge the multiplicity that uh, operates in our world, that we have this like incredible um, ability not to be force ourselves to harmonize everything. That state of multiplicity is, it, it d uh, dissolves all contradiction because things can coexist just like they are on your iPhone or on your smartphone. And I think it's something we're, we're hopefully experimenting with today, but it's also something that uh, liberates us from the burden that we oftentimes felt we had to have in the past, this conformist burden. The great Eastern European mystic, Reb Tzadok of Lublin, taught that in each dark turn of history, there is a secret light concealed that must be liberated by those who suffer its challenges. Reb Tzadok reinterpreted the Hebrew phrase from the Jewish book of Kohelet, Ze leumat ze, to mean this on account of this. On account of this painful challenge, we discover this transformation that will change our sense of being for the better. This is not to justify or even validate the abhorrent tragedies and injustices that brings us to where we are. However, what has happened, has happened. And now our work begins in reconfiguring and gluing back together all the broken remnants into something stronger and better than could ever have existed before. How do we relate to our past in a way that does not perpetuate a new version of old structures? And this, I think, is the key challenge. Oftentimes, we do a form of window dressing, where you literally, you, 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 you use the language of revolution, the language of progress, but in the end of the day, you're, you're keeping and retaining the very same structures that you pretend to fight against. And this is something that we've witnessed throughout history in different political movements that oftentimes raise the banner of revolution, but then they become the very same uh, oppressors that they sought to undermine. We see this, all, we, we see this also uh, theoretically, where, the, where theoretical discourse turns into ideology, where ideas that, uh, and, thinker, and thinkers are repurposed uh, in order to further whatever causes the, those who instrumentalize them want to. I think it is very valuable here to look at the words of the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And these words come from the end of his life, where he took a very a, a different turn than what he's associated with. So we're going to look through these words, um, and I'll invite Ohad to read. Criticism is no longer going to be practiced in the search for formal structures with universal value, but rather as a historical investigation into the events that have led us to constitute ourselves and to recognize ourselves as subjects of what we are doing, thinking, saying. Thank you. This comes from What is Enlightenment, uh, an essay that was actually published in 1984. So I think the first point to emphasize here, we have to read this very closely, it's a very important text, is he says, he doesn't deny that there are historical structures that shape us, but they shape you in a very specific way, in your personal trajectory. You cannot universalize those structures. And this is the first point that is drastically different than a lot of the discourse today, where people will oftentimes seek a structure that might be very relevant to a very particular context, and they will universalize them. But Foucault is saying, no. Yes, observe how it brought you to where you are, 
But no, do not uni universalize it beyond your own subjective space or location. And Foucault makes this very clear, um, what his goal is, in the next text we're going to read, from the same essay, Ali. It is not seeking to make possible a metaphysics that has finally become a science. It is seeking to give new impetus as far and wide as possible to the undefined work of freedom. Thank you. I feel today many of us who launch critiques of past structures, whether that being on a personal or larger scale, forget why we are doing this. And this is the key point. There's many key points. This is one of the many key points uh, that we ought not essentialize and turn these critiques into their own metaphysics, into their own esoteric essence that somehow a select few have knowledge of. There's another wonderful quote from the Mishnah that we talked about in, the, I think, in the last uh, Shir video we did at ID Festival, which is, which means turn it over and turn it over for all is in it. And this is referring to the Jewish hermeneutic technique in relationship to the Torah, where you turn it over and turn it over. You take a cyclical approach, not a progressive approach. It's not about getting to this fixed truth that once you discover, you're done. It's saying that the critique is constant. And that we, and, and, but then what does the critique support? And in, in this case, if our, if our critique supports freedom, that's the ultimate goal that we need to ask. What will lead us to freedom? Not what will lead us to some esoteric truth. Sarah, why don't you read the next uh, text? This work done at the limits of ourselves must, on the one hand, open up a realm of historical inquiry, and on the other, put itself to the test of reality, of contemporary reality, both to grasp the points where change is possible and desirable, and to determine the pre precise form this change should take. This means that the historical ontology of ourselves must turn away from all projects that claim to be global or radical. In fact, we know from experience that the claim to escape from the system of contemporary reality so as to produce the overall programs of another society, of another way of thinking, another culture, another vision of the world, has led only to the return of the most dangerous traditions. Wow. This was 19, 1984, actually, a, a very uh, um, a, a powerful year with many associations. Um, but I think here what's interesting, and this is something that is a, a wonderful kind of um, meeting point between Foucault and the Jewish tradition, is a, the, this idea of a, of a universalism, that, uh, of, a, of a radicalism in the sense of like that there's one root and this is the root for everything. The word radical comes from the word uh, for root is something that, uh, that both he rejects and we reject in the Jewish tradition. There is a subjectivity that we all possess. And in the Jewish tradition, on the other side of our subje subjectivity, there is only what we call in, um, in Hebrew, ayin, nothingness, this kind of full nothingness. And so much of our lives is filtered through our subjective selves. And that's important. We operate in, the, in this intersubjectivity. So we certainly need to take into account that intersubjectivity. But any pretense that we can somehow universalize this will lead us to a very dangerous space where these things become essentialized, they become oppressive, they silence you, they cancel you, and they bring us to literally the very th exact same thing that we sought to escape. In order to be effective, critique, change, and action must be situated in the contemporary present. And its form should intelligently respond to the context of the present. Again, these sane words can apply to us as individuals as well as on a larger social scale. Sachi? Yeah, I think that um, the first quote by, by Foucault is it, very important in that regard because it's going against the notion of philosophy as, as science. 
and science is a language that determines by determined by rules and and those rules are something that you can hold on to but there's there there this is also something that is very limiting in its in its essence and we and when he aspires towards freedom he he let go of the very old uh, philosophical tradition aspiring to 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 truth or to 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 equate itself with science and and he says that um that the inquiry should lead us away from there into into freedom i think it's really amazing how um when when we share the text when when we juxtapose uh rav alexandrov with foucault how similar they are where this shvirata kelim this breaking of the uh tools is very aligned with foucault's maybe breaking of philosophy breaking of these dogmas and these ideologies okay so we have anama reading the next quote from foucault the critical ontology of ourselves has to be considered not certainly as a theory a doctrine nor even as a permanent body of knowledge that is accumulating it has to be conceived as an attitude and ethos a philosophical life in which the critique of what we are is at one and at the same time the historical an analysis of the limits that are imposed on us and an experiment with the possibility of going beyond them thank you so let's break this down the critical ontology of ourselves is not something that can be essentialized even as we acquire knowledge and as we acquire data and facts even that cannot be fixed into some body into some essence instead he introduces a term very similar to rav alexandrov ethos an attitude a philosophical life in which the critique we are of what we are is at the same time the historical analysis of the limits that are imposed on us so these limits that are imposed on us are of course a product of our own journey of our own subjective journey that brings us to where we're situated in and i want to connect this again to the larger theme that we here that we are exploring tonight which is the tragedy that brings us to where we are shapes us and of course limits us to a certain sense because we we only exist in what we exist in yet we strive to go beyond them we work through them to get us to a further stage and that's the practice and that's the work this practice towards creating a world that transcends its limits and and it's a bit of a paradox because you have to go through this world that is limited it's like with language to use language to go beyond language or using language and employing the limits of them and that tension is something that we feel uh throughout in in Jewish theology and in the Jewish tradition we need not reduce our being to any fixed structure or dynamic as tempting and as easy as this is instead we can dissolve the fixed structures that we think we're tied to and experiment with new and unforeseen ways of constituting ourselves and life and even when we take something innovative that's radically innovative and new we ought to always be careful not to let that turn into another fixed structure another thing the subversive intense radical and complex 19th century hasidic mystic Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav or Breslov provoked intense controversy throughout much of his life. He endured bans and cancellations, broken relationships and an onslaught of vitriol, often based on a seemingly unbridgeable gap between how others perceived him and how he saw himself. Possessing a deeply sensitive soul as a result of the controversy, on an emotional level he suffered immensely. and developed a unique world view that explored what emerges from the pains and sufferings that a seemingly cruel world is so generous to offer in the midst of these stormy conflicts 
in 1808 or 1809, he related the following dreamy story. I'll invite Sarah to read. It once happened that a controversy broke out concerning a certain person. He built for himself a tall tower and stayed within it. They fought against him, shooting at the tower with arrows and gunfire, but to no avail. Now there are precious stones which grow in the air, formed by mists. There was a, precious, a certain precious stone growing there in the air, which had not yet reached perfection. They shot it down with the arrows, and it landed on the tower. This stone contained such grace that as soon as it fell upon the tower, they all bowed down to him, saying, Long live the king, long live the king. Thank you. So this story could be understood in many different ways, and we're going to look at a few different ways. Um, but on a very personal level, I think there's something very powerful here. This feeling of being attacked, but it's through the attack that you get somewhere that you could not have been without that attack, without that suffering. The attacking bullets and arrows brought the precious stone down. Without the attacks, the stone would remain concealed in the vapors and mists above. The conflict itself is necessary to bring us to a new position that could not be obtained without the attack. With this ethos in mind, we can look at the following text from the Talmud. I'll invite Leon to read this. This is from the Gemara Sanhedrin 7a. Seven pits for the person of peace, one for the evildoer. Thank you. So we, we're forced to ask, why should a person of peace have seven pits? Have seven obstacles? While an evildoer only has one. You think it should be the other way around, that the people that do bad, they're the ones that should be stumbling all the time. And why is it that the, um, that the person of peace has, has more? Is this a case of blind indifference of good and evil? In the sense of that it makes no difference, you can be good and you'll trip and you can uh, do bad and not? Or of the resilience of a peaceful person? That a peaceful person can put up with it more? Or can we understand this text in a radically different way? with Rabbi Nachman in mind. Might it be that it is precisely the pits and obstacles of life in history, the controversies, the mistakes, the conflicts that make peace possible? It is no secret that a person that knows and suffers war craves and loves peace. Each pit is dug with our mistakes and failings. Each pit almost consumes us and we are given a choice to stop and indeed remain as we were, to conform to the situation or to grow and emerge refined. Indeed, both with glass and with human souls, it takes fire to refine. And I want to emphasize what he's saying is, is that peacefulness is a product of war. And we know that in our own lives, when you get tired and tired of conflict, when you make mistakes, you grow. You look at somebody who's so sensitive and so aware and so mature, it doesn't mean that they were always that way. They had to get there. The dynamic and fluid nature of being, including the rough and conflict-ridden moments to Rabbi Nachman, is what promotes the greatest personal growth and makes life worth living. Maybe you can also share about from your song, because I think it's kind of similar to some of these ideas. Um, yes, um, actually, uh, in my song, Brich Mich, it is about the idea that I want to understand and uh, learn through all these obstacles. And um, I also have a feeling that a lot of empathy that I am able to feel definitely comes from many you know struggles that I experienced myself so if there was someone coming up to me I have an understanding um, we can like come together we can start to fix um, things and yes so see, seeing this as your opportunity and also um, as actually this is life you know 
this is kind of what it is about because I'm I wouldn't um, everything I have I would never want so there would be nothing left to want if uh, what's life about then? If there was no will, if there was no wishing, if there is no hope. So, but there wouldn't be any reasons for that. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I was also thinking about it in terms of like relationships that we have with people or um, however, yeah, large scale or micro scale, but just in terms of sometimes I think that there can be sort of the little things add up and add up and like there can be sort of resentment simmering or you know something simmering and it isn't until you sort of reach that head like if you have a really awful sort of conversation or argument with someone that you can reach this point of whatever you want to call it authenticity or truth that sort of the things have to reach ahead and then it's there that the change can happen and only there. I also think from a from a Jewish Jewish perspective as well, our our texts, like the Talmud and so on, they're not one person telling you what to do or what's right or what's wrong, but it's a discussion. It's about okay, one person is saying that, another one is saying that, and we find arguments for everything and we get to a bigger point of view. From these arguments, other arguments result. And so we get a we get a deeper and deeper view of, of something and you can't just say, okay, I have this one rabbi I follow and everything he says is right, but you have to look at all the different perspectives. And also in democracy, it's the same. Like if we have one ruler who says that everything's right, that won't work. We have to, uh, we have, we need other opinions as well, because um, if we have this, this opposition, then we um, get to new op opinions get to a better life. Thank you. A lot. The Sanhedrin text uh, speaks about seven pits for the righteous person and only one for the evildoer. Now you think about the numbers, seven and one, those are, they symbolize those typological numbers. And seven means like a greater amount or maybe even like um, infinite numbers. So it's something, a permanent position that you need to tackle within life to get it to this piece. Whereas for the evildoer, it's basic one, one thing. It's, it's basically hopeless, almost. That's how, what I get from the text. And I, I, I think the, we all start on the first pit as the so-called evildoer. It's only when you decide to go through the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and sixth and seventh that you become the person of peace. So, and, and to take your um, example, it's interesting. In Hebrew, seven is in the language of complete. It's like a full week, seven days. And the word for peace, and in, in particular the word, the, the word that's used in the Talmud, it can also be interpreted as a complete person. That we're complete when we go through these trippings, these stumblings, these falling down. And as the week has seven days, but then it begins again. again. Yeah, exactly. And then again, you have to go through the seven if you want to get to that point of peace. If you stop at one, then what are you? And I think it's something that we need to hear now more than ever, is to let people trip, to let people stumble. When we cancel people, when we bury people, we, we leave them at one. Let them go to two, let them go to three, let them go to four, let them go to five, let them go to six, let them go to seven, and then you know what, they're gonna have to go to one again. We all are. And that's the nature of the Jewish-German relationship, it's the nature of interpersonal relationships, it's the nature of our own interior relationship. And it's something we can draw on. Also what you, what you said, that if we just cancel somebody or if we say this opinion is wrong, then we get, then we inscribe our opinion in stone and think, okay, that's, that's the right thing. But maybe you and somebody else, you first of all wanted to cancel, you said, okay, um, he has the wrong opinion, he has the wrong view, um, are not so far apart, but you have to talk about it. What do you mean by that? And um, maybe you also um, get a new point of view yourself. Maybe you first of all say, okay, this person's wrong, that's not the right opinion. And uh, I think in, in modern society we are often really keen on um, saying, okay, there's something that's right or, or wrong, but I don't think it's good to 
look at it as like opposite sides. Like you have good and you have bad, but it's a spectrum. I think it's a, also an interesting idea to say, okay, we don't have darkness, but we only have the absence of light. Or we don't have something bad, we only have the absence of good. And if you think of it like that, it's only how far towards one of the sides is it. You can't put it in opposite directions. You have to see the, the spectrum there. And I think um, if you talk about it, you most of the time get closer to each other and um, find a common point of view and not go apart. Thank you. Um, I think it's an excellent point in, and it highlights the instability that exists with perspectives, with ideas, and with ourselves. So by, by embracing that instability, by allowing for a discourse, for that rubbing up against each other of ideas, what sparks will come? So this is a great point to go to our next text, also from Rabbi Nachman in Chaye Moaran. Uh, Anama, why don't you read this one? I, in every single moment, become another person. I need constant controversy, for I keep going in every moment from level to level. If I knew that I stand now at the same place that I stood an hour ago, I would absolutely not want to exist in this world. Thank you. Who wants to be where they were a year ago? Nobody, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and by that same token, we also can't hold people to what they were a year ago. People change and they grow. Is Rabbi Nachman rationalizing his contentious nature? Is there a way to achieve peace without war? Or is it simply human nature to rise and fall like a wave? It's funny that we have such a problem accepting it because just our body itself, like while I started making the sentence, I was, my cells were in a different way, like I had a different amount, like, you know, cells are dying, so the, now apparently at that age. <laughs> um, so I'm actually not even physically the same person I have been before. So the, but the way of approach, like the approach or the, to have that as a goal, as an achievement is so funny because it's not our nature. It isn't even so. Absolutely. This is the point of what we're doing here is number one, we acknowledge that the emptiness and change and brokenness and destruction offers us something that was unforeseen and that, that could not have existed before. That doesn't mean we, we're happy about what happened, but we are where we are and we have to work with where we are. We have to find the light. And that's the other thing, to seek light. We acknowledge the brokenness, but we want to put the glue in, the gold. Let, let, let the cracks be sealed with gold, not with hate. Yeah, I don't know, but like in general, um, regarding war, if we actually need war on this planet, I do believe that it's not necessary. But if I, if I, if I may, I, I don't think the, the purpose, it doesn't advocate to break something. It's just to seize an opportunity if it gets broken. It's not like you have to go and, and, and start wars or break your bodies yeah, or, sure. or break everything. But if it happens, you should take the opportunity to glue it together and make it stronger. Yeah, and that's the key point here. We would never wish for the brokenness that is imposed on us by whatever journey has brought us here. But it's happened. And we have a choice of how do we respond to those broken fragments. How do we glue them together, whether we glue them together or not? And what is that glue made of, if we want to stay with the metaphor? And I think that's an incredible opportunity for us, 1,700 years of Jews in Germany, and, German, and uh, Germans and Jews, a Germ th th this proximity, this interconnectedness has created both of us. It's not that one of us is influenced any more by the other than the other is by the other. We, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's one that involves a lot of blood, a lot of tragedy, a lot of brokenness. But we can, t we can be much more proactive in gluing together the pieces, the broken pieces, and deciding what we see as broken and what we see is liberated.
we can return now to the original story of Rabbi Nachman and observe how fickle his attackers are. One moment they attack him, then the next moment he is their king. Surely this new, newly made king at one point will lose the stone and the crown and have to build another tower to fend off his attackers and wait for a new stone to fall. Up and down and up and down goes life. Let's keep looking up as the arrows are shot in our direction, hoping to catch what precious stone will fall from the mist. I want to thank everybody here today. I want to thank the ID Festival, Ohad Ben Ari, as both the director of the ID Festival and as an amazing friend and um, composer and, um, and Shiro member. I'm really grateful. I'm also grateful to the Leishalle um, for uh, letting us use their incredible space. I want to thank um, Ali and Leon for composing an amazing original song that really, I feel, captures exactly what we're talking about, this new way of connecting to text and to idea. Well, who, who would have imagined we'd be quoting the, the Gemara, Hasidus, Foucault, um, and uh, Rav Alexandrov in the Leishalle with music and different people from around the world. I want to thank Sachi for... Um, sharing with us this archival material and also his perspective. I want to thank Sarah Foster. Uh, Sarah is an incredible um, contributor to the Shiro community in, with, with her time and effort and um, a great uh, mind. And we're really grateful to have uh, Sarah here. And I want to welcome uh, the Hamburg-based people that are new to Shiur, um, Anama and Paul Chaim. Uh, and I want to invite everybody watching to uh, visit us um, in Shiur. We meet every Wednesday. Um, we explore a newsletter that I write with different guest presenters. We've had already um, a few people here as guest presenters and are very involved. And uh, join us in innovating and changing and transforming and working and gluing together all those cracks into something gold. Have a happy Tuba Av. Thank you guys.
Grave 